The European heads of state and government, except the British one, met in December 2016 to discuss the handling of the Brexit. They stated that they are willing to catch up negotiations with the UK in consensus. Any agreement will have to be based on a balance of right and obligations. Especially access to the single market requires acceptance of all four freedoms. The free movement of goods, the freedom of movement for workers, the rights of establishment and freedom to provide services, and the freedom movement of capital. As long as the Brexit is not fully executed, Britain remains member states with all rights and duties. This concerns also Britain's duty not to negotiate new bilateral free, free trade agreements before exit is proceeded. The heads of state and government have also endorsed procedural arrangements for Brexit negotiations. The European Commission will lead the negotiations on the EU side. There will be no preliminary negotiations before the British notification of withdrawal, not even about procedure or possible transitional arrangements. In accordance with the EU treaties, the two-year period for the exit negotiations start with the official not notification of withdrawal. The period can be prolonged only un anomalously. But what will happen if there will be neither a negotiation agreement nor an agreement about continuing to negotiate after two years? You recognize already that I sometimes can only leave you with question marks. Central to the remaining European member states is to keep unity and solidarity and to preserve the European unity so far. After the exit, the remaining EU member states, the EU27, will have to adapt to the new situation. Especially we will have to discuss to deal with the new lower EO budget. What to do with the former British Parliament seats in the EU Parliament and where to transfer EU agencies from Britain. ETC, ETC, ETC. 16 plus 1. You know what that is? I will explain. Not only the northeast of Europe causes trouble, there is also a challenge waiting to be handled in a very east of Europe, the so-called 16 plus 1 formula that stands for 16 central and eastern European states, some of them EU member states, but not all of them, and the one that is China, the historic center, empire of the center. The 16 plus 1 is a Chinese initiative similar to other Chinese market penetration strategies, but also one of the main platforms aimed, aimed at enhancing multilateral cooperation to create a modern Silk Road. I shall promote the economy, it shall promote the economic integration of China, Asia and Europe by improving infrastructure and increasing trade and investment. Within this broader initiative, Europe is emerging as one of the top destinations of Chinese capital. The Central and Eastern European countries represent a collective population of over 120 million, which rising per capita income levels. That offers new market op opportunities. The Eastern European region, furthermore, represents a potential platform for China to leverage its growing economic and political influence with the EU as a whole. The China footprint in Europe has expanded significantly over the last decade. In 2015, Chinese investment in the EU reached the record high of 23 billion US dollars from less than 3 million, pardon, 3 billion US dollars in 2009. In this context, Central and Eastern Europe also received an unprecedented level of attention. To strengthen economic cooperation with the region, the fifth 16 plus one summit concluded 2016 in Riga, Latvia. 
It is not difficult to imagine that there also exists a political intention behind China's interest in Central and Eastern European countries. There is the Latin quotation of divide et infera, impera, or divide and rule, that could be relevant in this respect. China not only invests in infrastructure sectors like telecommunication, logistics, and can compete in public procurement in Europe, all things that are restricted to foreign investors in China. By building up assets in these countries and fostering competition among them, China is both increasing its economic and its political influence only in some selected EU member states. China may have in mind the much-expected investment agreement between the EU and China that is currently under preparation. In order to successfully negotiate that, the EU needs to speak with one voice. That seems more difficult if the relationship between China and the EU is primarily driven by individual member state interests to the detriment of wider EU objectives. The 16 plus 1 initiative will create more opportunities for China to direct its products, capital, labor and services to the Central and Eastern Europe countries. However, Chinese spillover in this region will not remain confined to infrastructure, trade and investment, but will also subtly extend to politics, culture and security. It seems worthwhile to pay attention to China's investment strategies in the region. Perhaps it is time to initiate a new debate about how to best coordinate a comprehensive response at the EU level to take into account both the benefits and the consequences of Chinese investments in the region. Migration. Another challenge of the whole Europe is migration. Millions of migrants and refugees crossed into Europe in the last years. Our societies and citizens still struggle to cope with the influx and the EU debates on how best to deal with the coming people. Which countries are the migrants from? The conflict in Syria made it and still makes people flee, but the ongoing violence in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the situation in Eritrea, as well as poverty in Kosovo, are also leading people to look for new life elsewhere. Germany receives the highest number of migrants and refugees, which already over 1 million in 2015 only. And uh, I've just uh, recognized the new statistics. Germany has now 83 million people living in the country. Uh, number, a size we never had before. In EU member states, populist forces promote fear of foreign infiltration. That puts pressure on the establishment of democratic parties and endangers the democratic liberties. People fear that terrorists are among the refugees and are skeptical whether the refugees can adapt to Western value and integrate into the labor markets. Events like the terrorist attack of a Tunisian man who hit a Berlin Christmas market with a truck murdering 12 people show that the anxieties are not made up out of thin air. And of course there have been other terrorist attacks in France, for example, and other parts of Europe. Persons whose request for asylum has been rejected, had been rejected often, cannot be deported back to their state of origin, origin due to the lack of documents or missing readmission agreements with the state of origin. What does Europe do and what can we do? First of all, problems should be got at their root. It is preoccupying to see that many people must flee from war. It is also sad to see that many others cannot see any future for themselves and their children in their homeland because of political oppression, poverty or violence. That should be changed at first. But these problems are often complex 
and difficult to resolve. This is also a task for all diplomatic missions. And in the meantime, Europe tries to handle with the arriving people. The EU endeavors to establish a common asylum system to coordinate the arriving people. Germany strongly supports these efforts. Unfortunately, not all member states do. Furthermore, the European Union enhances migration partnerships with the states of origin and transition, such as Mali, Niger and Ethiopia. These uh, concentrate mainly on training and financing police and border patrols in African countries in return for promise to take back re rejected asylum seekers. The EU has put up another partnership with Turkey aiming to keep refugees in Turkey. 